Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about repentance and respect for a holy God. This is completely missing in our culture. And uh, we um, come into church. Uh, I, I'm amazed at the skimpiness of dress, the casualness of dress, the uh, almost ball game, ballpark kind of uh, feeling that we have. We've lost all respect for uh, the distinctive way in which we honor God. It's as if he re re regards no honor. I uh, was uh, in a court recently and I had forgotten how strict they were so I took a book and I thought I would read in the back and they made it very clear to me. Uh, you will not take the book in. Uh, you will not take anything in. You will not take a cell phone in. You will not do any kind of texting. You will pay attention. You will sit up and pay attention. And if you go to sleep, somebody will wake you up. Uh, so there's more respect for the courtroom and the judge than there is for a holy, sovereign God. We've lost all respect for God in our culture. And so a part of what must be recovered in prayer, healthy prayer, is respect for this God. We've talked about the presence of God, impossible to pray without an encounter with the presence of God. We've talked about positioning yourself in His love. First position, push back all the God helped me, all the God used me, settle down. God, I know that you love me and I love you with all my heart. You don't begin with I love you. It isn't, that, it isn't your love that motivates God's love for you. It's His unconditional love, His shocking unconditional love for you and me uh, around us that motivates our own love. We don't love Him with our love in one sense. We love Him with His love returned, the love of God shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit, His love given to us. And we love back with that unconditional uh, love. And then we, we, we begin to talk about purity, respecting His, His holiness. And we want to do one more session on purity and prayer. And that me means what we've got to do is balance intimacy with God, which we've emphasized all of my life. And I'm an old person. We've emphasized intimacy with God, but we've lost this understanding of the transcendence of God. We were made for intimacy with God. And that's the essence. It is the very heart uh, of prayer. But the view of intimacy must not forget that we're still mortals prone to sin. And we are relating to a holy God only by grace. And that we live in a world that continues to, that continues to sin. It continues its rebellion against God, and it is therefore under wrath. We are living on borrowed time, and we are facing inevitable judgment. Sometimes as, sometimes as a nation, certainly as the world, the planet, sometimes as a state or city, we face judgment. This is clear in Scripture, but we seem to have forgotten this with an overemphasis upon the love of God and the grace of God and a complete loss uh, of the sense of, of uh, judgment. All, all the while, we as believers and often those around us are gifted with this bubble of grace, this blessing that has been over America because of its Christian heritage. It's now beginning to dissipate. And this bubble of grace creates an illusion that the rest of the world is like this, that the rest of the world has plenty, that the rest of the world has Disneyland, and that the rest of the world is, and it's simply not true. And so what we have to do is come back to a place of, of, of balance. In moments of grace, we enjoy intimacy with God, and we come to see it as the rule and not the exception in a sinful world facing God's judgment. So, 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 so we, we must consistently acknowledge that the God who is our Father 
is also the God who is utterly other. He is the rightful Lord of the earth. He is its creator. He is its sustainer. Though he is dishonored and rejected and ignored and told that he didn't create it, it just evolved. And that he's not the only redeemer that offers eternal life. There are many paths. There are many paths to God. So this one-sided, delusional view, absent of an understanding of impending global wrath, leads to decidedly a decidedly subjective relationship with God. We measure everything in terms of our own personal warmth and intimacy with God, and we lose biblical objectivity altogether. I just realized how heavy this is. Uh, This really, if you can get your head around this, this is really a wake-up call to us in terms of how we pray and in terms of how we approach uh, God. What we keep doing in America is we keep privatizing faith and losing this cosmic, this cosmic perspective. So you cannot in prayer, in healthy prayer, allow uh, intimacy to eclipse transcendence. And I think Pentecostals and evangelicals uh, who speak very often of the felt presence of God do this without even, without even realizing it. The transcendence of God. What are we talking about? Well, it refers to his loftiness. It refers to his utter otherness in a class all by himself. He creates the universe and sits outside it. Uh, uh, <laughs> he, can be, he can be experienced, but he cannot be uh, fully known. He is past finding out. He is father, and yet he is the exalted and unapproachable one. He is supreme. He is in comparable. So there, so there is an infinite distance between men and God, and, and even the redeemed and, and, and God. No matter how long you've walked with the Lord, there's an infinite distance. You're still mortal, and He is God. We're like Him. We're created by Him, created in His image, and yet no one is like Him. Let me ask you this question because I think this just bounces around on what what I'm trying to get to. I often ask people, if you can only give one word that describes God, what word would that be? And inevitably, immediately, the bubble up in the crowd is love. Love. God is love. And that that is the script of the culture. We're living in Uh, a a, a culture where people believe and want to believe that God is, that God is, is love, but they're wrong. They're wrong that the one word that describes God, that the ultimate word that describes God is love. And, And I think because of that, not only the church, but the whole culture is wrong about its view of of God. Now hang on with me just, just a little bit and let me explain what, what I mean. The current cultural drum roll, and, and I hear it in mega churches and I hear it all over the nation, the current cultural drum roll is for a God who loves everybody unconditionally without any standards, without any demands. But it is not His love that most clearly defines the God of the Bible. It is His holiness. We see the holiness of God in reference to moral purity, but the holiness of God is really about His infinite Otherness. The holiness of God is what makes him transcendentally autonomous, utterly different, unthinkably holy, and wholly entire to himself. His holiness is not a, a, a mere attribute of himself among many others. It is the ultimate descriptor of, of who he is. Everything proceeds from his holiness. Love, truth, power, grace, wrath, mercy, judgment, holy, kadosh. It means cut off. It means separate. It's the idea that God is in a class all by himself, 
unlike any other creature or any created thing. Arthur Pink said, he is solitary in his majesty. He is unique in his excellency. He is peerless, no peers, in terms of his, in terms of his perfection. So intimacy cannot be allowed to degenerate into familiarity. And I think that's what's happening in our churches and in our culture. God is Father, but He's not Daddy. Now, I know you've been taught, called Him Daddy God. Everybody does this, Daddy God, Daddy God. But Jeremiah Jacob, who is now dead, is a theologian, and he set forth the premise that, uh, that uh, he, in Greek it's potter, in, in Aramaic it's... it's, uh, it's um, uh, and my mind just went uh, blank, Abba. Uh, and he set forth a premise that Abba could be translated and understood as daddy. James Barr, in theological journals, within six months or so, challenged the etymology, this claim of uh, Jeremiah Jacob, that, that his translation was not, uh, uh, he didn't adequately defend it. And, and Jeremiah Jacob actually withdrew his assertion that Abba could be understood as daddy, but the feathers are already out of the pillow. Now, I don't suggest that you correct people who call God daddy, nor do I suggest that it's wrong for you to refer to him in that very familiar, intimate way. But I would say to you that based on the etymology of the Aramaic, you don't have a basis for doing that. And I would also suggest to you that because we've done that, we've created this bent, overly familiar view of God where intimacy eclipses transcendence. So the warmth of God's fatherless, fatherliness must not, must be conjoined, I'm sorry, to his transcendence. Don't forget who your father is. We'll come boldly to the throne of grace. That's the exception. It's not the rule. That's the exception. It's not the rule. You didn't come boldly to any throne, not in ancient times, not in biblical times. You didn't come unless you were invited. You didn't speak unless you were spoken to, and you never put forth a request. Who are you to ask the king to do anything for you? And so against this backdrop, Hebrew says we come boldly. Anybody who lived in a culture that had a king who sat upon the throne knew that's insane. That is the ultimate grand exception. But what happens is we've made the exception the rule, and we've lost all historical cultural context for understanding how exceptional this idea is that we come boldly to the throne of God. And the result is a complete loss of solemnity and worship. And, 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 that, and at the Lord's table, that loss of solemnity, it's just crackers and juice. That loss is stunning. I remind you that in the apostolic church, they would allow people to come who had not made a commitment to Christ or were exploring Christ or were in some form of discipleship. But until they had been affirmed as Christians and their theology affirmed, and until they had been baptized, they were dismissed when the church proper came to the table. There was no such thing as open communion to just anybody. You had to be certified. This is the apostolic church of the second, third century. Because approaching the Lord's table was a solemn thing. And there they waited and tarried for the prophets to speak, for the Holy Spirit to speak, to them. In a sense, there was the, there was the service of the, of the Word and then the service of the, of the table. And the table was only for verified believers who committed themselves to the blood covenant and were willing to lay their lives down as Christ had laid His life down from them. It was much more solemn than what we have now. And in every city, there was one table. The, the bread and the blood were taken to the widows or taken to the shut-ins, or they were taken to other places where believers might be meeting, but there's one table because of the unity of the church and the absolute importance of blessing that bread and that, and, and, and that cup. We no longer worship as if our God is a consuming fire. We don't worship like, like that. Worship can't be a matter of mood. 
can't be a matter of affect, uh, nor can your prayer. We're reminded in the example of Nehemiah, and I noted this earlier, that the emotional state is to be tempered by simply being in the court of the king. The king questioned Nehemiah, the cupbearer. Why why is your countenance fallen? You you did not disclose your own mood to God. You didn't set the mood of the court. The king set the mood uh, 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 of the court. And so again, let me say it differently. The mood of the king, not the servant, not the courier, set the climate of the royal of the royal court. We carry our moods into a uh, prayer. Let me say it in a different way. The agenda was not set by the servant. It was set by the king, not the courier, not the subject. The king determined who would speak. If anyone spoke other than himself about what they would speak and for how long they, they would speak in prayer, we tend to drive the agenda. Modern prayer tends, we tend to drive the agenda. We dictate to God. We make demands of God. We come, speak to God, give Him our list, and, uh, and, and, and leave. I'll never forget as a young pastor, prayed fervently. I was praying the tears were dropping. I was just going through a list of the people in the church. I was on all fours. I was praying. And I got up to leave, and the Lord arrested me, and He said, while I'm running all these errands for you, what is it that you plan to be doing? No matter how fervent you care, prayer cannot be a list. It cannot be errands that you assign to to, to God. You cannot come and speak to God and leave. God, the king, summons you and he speaks and then tells you to leave. But, 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 but but, But you and I don't control the process of, 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 of prayer. We prefer today a God who listens and serves and takes directions and, and instructions from us. This is an upside down understanding of prayer. We have made the exception. We have made the exception the rule. Uh, our coming to God anytime we choose and virtually ignoring Him at other times is wrong. Our talking and thinking uh, that His role is listening and not our listening to Him is backward. We, we, we have Him serving us rather than our serving Him. Our mood dominates the prayer time rather than Heaven's mood dominating us. We take the lead in the conversation rather than His taking the lead. And with a list, we rush into the throne room and we ask rather than worship. We use intimate terms for God. He's our lover. He's our friend. He's our comforter. He's our companion. He's our father. He's husband. He's, he's bridegroom. And evangelical Pentecostals rarely refer to God as the Almighty or the Ancient of Days or even His holiness. In an evangelical Pentecostal culture that's uncomfortable with formal worship, with liturgy, and also with a holy, lofty God, we, we sadly dress God down and make Him one of the guys. And this leaves us with half a God. You see, and I think I'll say this later, but if you have a God who is all love and no truth, if you let love eclipse truth because truth is too hard, you've got half a God. If you've got truth but no love, you miss the greatest truth, and that is the love of God. You've got half a God. You need a God that that brings us to the intersection of love and truth. Because it's not truth that sets you, or love that sets you free, it's truth that sets you free. And it's love that makes the truthing and the truing and the straightening of our lives palatable. It, 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 that's, the, that's the anesthesia we need to, to embrace the truth. And, and by the way, at this intersection of love and truth, that's where the power of God dances. At this intersection of love and truth, this is where the power of God dances. God is love, but heaven as it worship doesn't cry love, love, love. It cries, 
well, you know, Old Testament and New. Holy, holy, holy. Because the holiness of God is the fountain of His transcendental nature. The holiness of God is the fountain of His transcendental nature. And, 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 and His autonomy and His self-sufficiency. His holiness is what makes His truth true truth. And His love, true love, pure love. Holiness is the superlative descriptor of God. And, and our felt sense, and this is especially true in Pentecostal circles, evangelical circles, our felt sense of God's presence must not displace the objective reality of His, of His transcendence. So overwhelmed with the fruit of grace, I, 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 I'm saved, I feel clean, I, I'm born again, I I feel the love of God overwhelmed with the fruit of grace. We can't forget that that derives from Golgotha's work of grace. And that was a statement not only about God's love, but about His holiness, about His judgment on sin, and about sin's ultimate fruit, which is, which is death. So the new life that we have, this felt sense of God's love and goodness, the fruit of grace that we experience in our, in, in, in our life it has to be tied back to the cross. It has to be tied back to the death of Christ. And it calls for our cross and it calls for a death in us. Our liberation from judgment is not because God has chosen arbitrarily to overlook and casually forgive sin. Christ took our sin. He took our, our judgment. And that should cause us to tremble, as Ezra says, at His Word, and repent before God. Our acceptance in heaven Again, it's tied to his momentary separation from the Father and his crucifixion. And, and only when we realize that the sin that God took from my life and put on Christ that resulted in that separation, that sin is deadly. And it produces separation. It breaks the fellowship with God and, and us. See, the cross is not merely about God's love. I, I say it to you again. It's, it, it's, it's about the truth of sin. Sin's wages really are death. And God is no respecter of persons. So when, and so when sin was found on His Son, though it did not belong to Him, He gained no exemption from sin's deadly penalty. Jesus tasted death. But due to His holiness, He was immune from its eternal effect. Oh, hallelujah. Let me say it again. Therefore, to detach the subjective, the, to detach the subjective and emotional satisfaction we have from the redemptive work of the bloody cross, from the objective story, uh, uh, fr from, from, from a message about sin's consequences, is a grave mistake. I think I need to say that again. Let me say it cl more clearly. If you detach this subjective and emotional satisfaction we have from the redemptive work of Christ, I'm saved. I feel clean. God loves me. Not My name is written down in, in, in the book of life. I have such peace. I have such joy. All of that is the wonderful felt dimension of, of, of redemption. But it comes from a bloody cross. It comes from a message about sin's consequences. And if you forget that, that is the grave mistake I think we are making. And that, that causes us to be superficial in our gratitude and not deeply moved by the depth of what the cross is really all about.
Christ lives in me, thank God, and in you. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. And so the life of Christ in us is rooted in the death of Christ for us. And by the way, it calls for the death and consecration of our lives to God. Oh, hallelujah. So that he might genuinely touch through our t- touching and love through our loving, care through our caring, and speak to our speaking until he, the invisible God, is made visible in us. Our subjective experiences with God must have roots in the objective record of biblical history. So experiential moments, as powerful as they are, their profound nature is not merely existential. Their meaning is explained in Scripture, which details the basis of this felt experience, the nature, the source, and and, and the purpose. And nothing is more important to your growth and development than a prayer life that's guided by biblical principles and open to God's creative and restorative workmanship in your life where He is repairing the damage of sin and reversing the effect of death and really imparting life to me. And that will not happen unless you realize your need to stay on the straight and narrow. And I don't, I don't think that's something that's conscious in the typical church member in, in America because we have a perennial emphasis on love, on the subjective, <clears throat> on relationship feelings and impressions that we detach from Scripture as the final interpreter and the jurist and the objective guide for all of these experiences. You're not saved because you feel saved. That feeling has to be interpreted in the light of the, of the Scripture. This is not subjective. This is very, very objective. And it has to be a part of your record in, the heaven, in heaven's courtroom. <laughs> a preaching, I don't mean to be... Uh, preaching. So, so, so the, scripture, the Scripture is full of examples of people who approach God on their own terms and fail to comply with His requisites or thought themselves exempt. Cain. I believe that he knew that only a blood sacrifice was required, but he, he decided to worship God in his own way. Nadab and Abihu who offered strange fire on the altar. They knew. They knew the pattern. You get fire off the brass altar and bring it into the most holy place or the holy place and offer it there. The fire that calls for the, for the crucifixion of sin, the fire that destroys sin and death and self and division, that was the only fire from that altar that was acceptable to light the golden altar but they they decided to light their own fire and they died in in, in the holy place. Yuza, who touched the ark and thought to steady the ark, uh, he thought the ark needed his his, help, the ark of his glory, and he he died. Uh, The veil worshipers and more, all of these made up their own rules or thought themselves exempt from God's uh, standards and they experienced judgment. It can be fatal to approach God on your own terms. Repentance, brokenness, humility, confession of sins, reverence for God's holiness, His sovereignty. These are things that the modern church seems to be oblivious to. Because we have an aberrant emphasis upon grace and love to the exclusion of truth and holiness. Uh, Intimacy with God and oneness or unity with Him have to be understood as happening in the context of a monopluric covenant. That's a fancy word. A deploric covenant is a covenant between two parties, a covenant between equals. Our covenant with God is not 
a diplurit covenant. It's a monoplurit covenant. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. God made a covenant with Adam and he failed and the covenant failed. God made a covenant with Noah and, and, and he sinned and the covenant failed. God made a covenant with Abraham and his children. God made a covenant with his children at Mount Sinai. If you do this, then I'll do this. If then. This is a covenant that is dependent upon the action and responses of the people of God. It is deploric in, in nature. It involves our responsibility to God. Here's what God ultimately did. He made a covenant with himself. He made a covenant that can't fail. He wrapped himself in flesh and he walked the earth as a man and he lived a perfect life. <clears throat> and so all the conditions, all the if-then conditions of the covenant were met. He gave himself, Christ did. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. God made a covenant with Jesus, the man, also the Christ, also the Lord. He made a covenant with himself in Christ. That covenant can never fail. Jesus has already lived his life on the earth, and he's lived a life that's perfect, and he's been accepted in heaven as a man. The first fruits of our resurrection. This covenant cannot fail. And you and I then are grafted into a covenant that can't fail. Wow, what an incredible idea. We're grafted in as the sons of God. We're grafted in as the bride partner, the bride partner of, of Christ. We're adopted as children into this covenant that cannot fail. There are if-then dynamics, but they don't cause the covenant to collapse. The covenant is sure. The New Testament in His blood is certain and sure. God has dictated all the terms of the encounter. The, the, a a monoplural covenant is, is not a partnership between equals. Though God treats us as intimates, that's a bequest of His gracious nature. If in this bubble of grace we forget who He is and who we are, we become presumptuous. And that is and that is tragic. We stand under the shadow of the covenant that God made with Christ and the covenant that Christ completed in the giving of His life as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We stand in the shadow of that covenant. And under the solemnity of the cross and God's judgment on sin found on His own Son, we stand there and there ought to be a fear there ought to be a trembling at the Word of God. There ought to be a respect. There ought to be a, a reverence that motivates us to live a holy life and not exploit the grace of God. Ancient mystics and modern-day charismatics, though in different ways, often blur the line between the Creator who forges the covenant and the creature. We are one with God by the blood of Christ upon the forgiveness of sins. We're joined to His holy nature. We're sanctified and we're launched into a process of transformation that we might be like, like Him. But that union, that union, spiritual and moral, is focused on thoughts and behaviors. It is not merely, not merely metaphysical. Uh, though, let me say it in a different way, though we are destined to become like God and we are now agents of His Word and work, we're not destined in this life or the one to come to become, to become God. And so prophetic words quickened by the Spirit and uttered by us may be potent, but they are not omnipotent. We can't lose sight. This is what I'm emphasizing over and over again here, that God is God and we are not. And familiarity with God due to this Aberrant emphasis upon intimacy leads to cheap uh, grace, as Bonhoeffer called it, a cheap grace posture. Now, now, let me turn the page just a little bit. The moment we see privileges and rights, uh, we are, our privileges as rights, we are in, we're in trouble. The loss of humility... or any presumption that God owes us anything, the failure to always honor the price 
paid for us, that restored the relationship. These are critical components to our spiritual health and vitality. One of the reasons for the balance issues that I'm talking about in reference to intimacy and, and, and transcendency is, is, again, the almost complete and utter dismissal of the concept of the fear of God. And this is not a marginal biblical idea. It's mentioned more than 150 times in, in the Bible. The exact phrase, the fear of the Lord, occurs 20 seven times, twice as, twice as many times as does the phrase love of God. That occurs 12 times. The fear of God, 150 times. Uh, the fear of the Lord, 27 times. You, you, you'll, you'll never understand the love of God until you couple it with a deep reverence for God. And only with a deep reverence and a lofty view of God will you appreciate the love of God. The age-old expression, God-fearing, has now become archaic. It's almost completely expunged from popular usage. The absence of the fear of God affects your, your prayer life. It affects personal and corporate morality, along with the quality of our witness. It, 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 uh, it affects the level of our faithfulness. It affects our language. It affects our demeanor. And, and thus, it affects our relationships with one another, not to mention shallow relationships, a shallow relationship with, with God. Moses instructs, show your fear of God by not taking advantage of each other. I am the Lord your God. Interesting idea, isn't it? Your understanding of who God is will cause you to treat me or him or her differently. And here's why we understand that. There's a sense in which God is found in terms of His image in every person. And the way I treat them is in effect the way I'm treating God. Show your fear of God by not taking advantage of each other. The, the, the absence of the fear of God results in a culture where people run over one another, where murders, almost 20,000 last year in a recent year, uh, bloodshed everywhere, a lack of respect. You, you find it, you find it, you find it everywhere. People run over you uh, on escalators on the street, blow their horns, a, a mad, crazy culture, no respect for other people. Because we don't understand that there is a God watching how we treat, how we treat one another. So the distorted perspective of God is the essence of idolatry because it refashions God. And consequently, it reshapes my thinking about God and you and my behaving before God and with you. It causes me to exploit grace, cheapen mercy, twist truth, ignore holiness, disbelieve in consequences and judgment, dismiss sin's toxic nature, and argue that God's power is limited to positive life enhancements in my behalf. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If there's no fear of God, there's a complete loss of wisdom in a culture. We do unwise things, unsmart things. And that's where we are. That's where we are in our, in our culture. It, it reverence, the fear of God, to say it differently, is the gateway. It is the door to perception. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The, the, the reverence for God is the gateway, the doorway to perception, not only of God, but, 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 of, but of Scripture, of discerning our world, of hearing the voice of God, of making decisions and more. If you don't reverence God, then your heart lights are turned off according to Romans 1. And you will not receive a revelation from God. God will not. If, if there's no fear of God, there'll be no reception of the wise nuggets of truth that help you become what God wants you 
to be. Without such reverence, we wander in confusion, we venture into ignorance, unaware, we accept unsound insights, and we become fools. Paul noted that when this happens, again, the heart lights go dark. What lights the heart? What illuminates inner perception? It's the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. How does that happen? By and in prayer. Prayer before a God that we fear, that we have a deep reverence for. You know, what happens is, Paul said, is people compensate by professing themselves to be wise. But a mere profession doesn't change reality. The inner darkness comes, though, unperceived to those who change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. We just lower the bar. And having lost our fear of God, we close the gate to wisdom and plunge headlong into, into folly. No respect, no reverence for God. Look at the culture that we are in. When you deny the existence of God or view Him only as an enlargement of yourself, only the human cast in a giant, giant form and not as utterly other, we forfeit an appropriate reverence of God and as a result, wisdom, sound thinking, prudent decisions, a deep prayer and worship are no longer possible. Here's the problem. You thought I was altogether like you. You didn't understand that I was holy, that I was utterly other. Repentance then becomes the measure of our capacity by grace to change. Grace comes into our life and repentance Repentance renounces. It becomes aware of the things in my life that are not like God, that are not appropriate, that are not in accord with the Scripture. And that awareness then, quickened by grace, brings about this thing called, this thing called conversion. Perhaps, at least in part, due to this loss of the fear of God and His transcendent holiness, even in the most conservative areas of the nation, more than 50% of people who say they pray do not pray about moral issues or choices in their lives. We, we, we pray and talk to God, but we, but, but we don't bring up, I need to change here. I know this is wrong. I know, you, I know that you're not happy about this in my life. We just ignore it as if, as if, as if it doesn't uh, exist. We see sin as no impediment in, in meeting with the Holy God. That's a problem. That's a problem. And that makes modern Christianity something other than biblical Christianity. This is apostasy. We are reinventing God. We are creating a new faith and calling it Christian and calling it biblical. I'm old now, so I, I, I'm, I'm just no holes barred. You know, we seem to be committed to, to create a God who nurtures us but doesn't curb our indulgence in destructive behaviors. In short, this God overlooks sin. This new God who celebrates us doesn't convict us. This is the deity that we prefer today. We want a God of, here it is again, love, but not one who imposes His truth on us or exposes us to the holiness, to His holiness that makes us, that makes us un 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 uncomfortable. And so objectionable sections of Scripture are being removed by this church, that church, this pastor, that church to make faith more culturally palatable, to change His words, substituting our own. This is the height of disrespect. Even His representatives don't revere Him. They too speak. Presumptuously, if you're in a church like this, unless you're a strong Christian, find a church that preaches the Bible. Unless you're a strong Christian and God has called you to stay there and pray for a revival in that church, you are in a church that's drifting towards or already in apostasy. You see, let me say it in a different way. Preaching without apology from Scripture has now been laid aside. Preaching, let the chips fall where they may. This is the Word of God, and I have to say this. This is, this, is, this is the Bible, and I have to tell you this. I have a responsibility as your pastor 
to tell you the truth about God. That, that's gone now. And, and then what, what we did was we moved from preaching to, to teaching. But that's too encumbered, too deep, too, too, too much stuff for people to get their head around. So then we moved in the American culture to inspirational speaking. Selective text uh, meant to inspire possibility, not to expose pathology. Biblical prayer is impossible without our being changed by encounters with a holy God. Prayer is not about changing God. It's the context in which God changes us. Nothing is more vital to the believer's growth and development than a prayer life that is open to God's creative, restorative workmanship in our lives. And this is what I, 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 just, I, just, I, I just grieve over the pastors that I hear preaching a message, a gospel that doesn't call for change. It's as if they don't believe that God could change people. And so you were born with this or born this way or whatever. But, and I know the Bible said that, but that's an obscure passage. We're just going to dismiss it. God loves you just like you are. He does love you just like you are, but he doesn't want you or me to stay like I am. He sees in me what I was created to be before the fall and what I can be by, uh, by grace. When we go, oh, how does be said, to our meeting with God, we should go like a patient to his doctor. First, to be thoroughly examined in the light of the Scripture. And then to be treated for our ailment. And then something will happen when you, when you pray. So repentance is the measure of our capacity by grace to begin change. Many believers see repentance as a one-time act in their lives occurring at the time of their new birth, their baptism, this is a narrow view. It's a flawed view because mature believers live in a spirit of humble brokenness before God. And as the revelation of God's holiness becomes clearer and the image of Christ becomes more focused to us, the mirror of the Word of God will reveal shocking incongruence between my life and that of Jesus Christ. So he's calling me to repentance in the light of the Word of God, in the light of the holiness of God. He's calling me sub to submission in the light of the sovereignty of God. He's calling me to grace that will empower conversion or change in my life in a process called sanctification. He justifies me. And then he begins to sanctify me. He sanctifies what I consecrate. He sanctifies what I release to him. He sanctifies the areas of my life where I stop fighting him. I stop resisting him. I submit to him. I say I can't change myself. Change me. And then the grace of God that flows through day after day prayer encounters over the word of God enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit, began to bring change in you until the sin begins to fall off and the shackles of sin fall off. And increasingly, hopefully, we become more and more like Jesus Christ. Well, we're, we're talking about the five keys to worshipful prayer, repentance, and awareness of a holy God. We'll leave this in the next session and we'll talk about the perspective that you have of God, and, and, and even, even more important perhaps, the perspective that God has of you. Learning to think about yourself the way God thinks about you. Because one of the major problems here, of course, is our mind. We're pulling down the strongholds, and we think about ourselves in crippled ways because we've, we've taken the patterns and views of the, of the old man, Adam, with us, and the Lord is chipping away to, to release us from those ties to the old man. The old man is not something in you. The flesh is in you. That's a problem. The old man is something you were in. It's the corporate Adam.
And though we've been redeemed and planted into the corporate Christ, the body of Christ, we, we're, being, we're being changed and transformed. And, 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 and God is wanting to make us like, like Himself so that we're free from the encumbrances of the old and we can walk in newness of life. So, Father, I pray that this session hasn't been overwhelming. I pray that those who have watched this will sense the grace with which I, I intended to share this. I pray that you'll restore to the church a, a, a fear and reverence of God. I pray that you'll help us balance love and truth and therefore holiness. I pray that you'll bring a brokenness. The con conviction doesn't cause us to want to run away. It doesn't beat us down. It's not the same as condemnation. You don't condemn us. But you do shine the light in our heart in a way that shows us there's still cobwebs and the spider's still working. And you, you, you want to set us free. We're going to heaven because of grace. But our effectiveness here and perhaps the role we'll play in eternity and the rewards that we'll have are contingent upon the level to which we've grown in grace. So don't let us just get saved and sit. Help us to be hungry. This is the most important thing we'll do on this planet. It isn't owning a cabin in the mountains or, 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 a, little, or a little cottage at the beach. The most important thing we'll know in this life, do in this life, is to press in to know you and the power of your resurrection. So change us, transform us, and let us know this is what prayer is really all about. I pray this in Jesus' name. God bless you. See you next week.